I'm delighted to introduce our speaker uh, tonight. Uh, my friend, Dr. Hausman Espino, is Associate Professor of Hispanic Ministry and Religious Education and the Director of Graduate Programs in Hispanic Ministry at Boston College's School of Theology and Ministry. Hausman was born in Colombia and taught philosophy and religion at various academic levels there before earning both a master's degree and a PhD from Boston College. Dr. Espino has been at the forefront of conversation about the growing Hispanic presence in the American Catholic Church with research that focuses on how the conversation between faith and culture shapes the church's ministerial and educational practices. Dr. Spina was the principal investigator for the National Study of Catholic Parishes with Hispanic Ministry, with reports from this study published in 2014. He was the co-principal investigator for the National Survey of Catholic Schools Serving Hispanic Families, and co-authored a 2016 report on those findings. This survey explored how Catholic schools can partner better with Hispanic families to educate the next generation of Hispanic Catholics. Dr. Espino has a long list of academic articles, chapters in book, and general ministerial publications to his credit. Uh, I can attest to that. Last year when he came up for uh, tenure, uh, as Dean, I had to uh, write a letter and I spent a lot of time reading because Hossman had written a lot and I learned a great deal in that process. He is the editor of Hispanic Ministry in the 21st Century, Present and Future, published by Convivium Press in 2010, and the author of Peter's Catechism, Who Do You Say That I Am? Why Did You Doubt? Do You Love Me? Uh, published in 2011 by Liguori. He's currently working on a book on multicultural Catholic parishes to be published with Fordham University Press. And also he's working on an edited collection of research-based essays on ministry with Hispanic Catholic youth and young adults scheduled to be published next year. In 2016, Dr. Espino was honored with the National Conference for Catechetical Leadership's National Catechetical Award for his, and I quote, dedicated service to the Catholic Church with ongoing pioneering spirit and innovative vision in the ministries of catechesis and evangelization. A much sought after speaker for national and international events, he holds a deep personal commitment to the church and to Hispanic ministry. He is the father of two young, lively and lovely children and he and his wife, Guadalupe, who's sitting in the back, are actively involved in service to the Church of Boston. A person of great energy, dedication, innovation, and scholarship, not to mention being irrepressible. Uh, please welcome Dr. Hausman Espino to speak on religious education in the age of Google, Facebook, Netflix, and SpaceX. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tom, and uh, thank you everyone for uh, this opportunity. You know, sometimes when uh, people read your biography, you want to meet that person, isn't it? It's just... It is an honor to deliver this uh, third annual STM Religious Education Lecture here at Boston College. I want to express my sincere gratitude to my colleagues in the School of Theology and Ministry who work hard providing these important spaces to advance reflection about religious education in ministry. I am humbled to follow in the footsteps of my two colleagues who delivered the first two iterations of this annual lecture, Dr. Thomas Groom and Dr. Jane Regan my mentors, my colleagues, companions along the journey, and yes, partners in crime, especially as we plot a better future for religious education. <clears throat> Today, I want to dedicate this lecture to two very important people in my life 
And two of the smartest Catholics I know, Victoria and William Ospino, they're back there. <clears throat> My children, when I think of the present and future of religious education in the United States, they are the first people, the first faces that come to my mind and to my heart. When I was their age, William is six, Victoria is four, I was surrounded by Catholics who were passionate about their faith and were the best catechists that I could ever have. My parents are not theologians, thank God, or ministers, Yet, with their generous actions, they introduced me to the idea that God is present in the everyday. I still remember my mother's altarcito, or small altar, in a corner of our house. As a child, I wondered why she would light a candle for a while, say a few prayers, and then went on with her daily routine. Soon I realized that the candle was lit when there was a difficult time in my family or when she had a special intention. My father very rarely talked about religion at home, but he was one of the first persons in the house to tell everyone that we should get ready to go to Mass. I don't know exactly what his theology is, but what I know is that many people see in him a kindness that today I would call evangelical. Growing up in Latin America, it was not unusual to see images and small religious symbols throughout the house. I made some, some fun of my mother for having multiple images of Mary and not knowing their different advocations. Well, who cares? The message was very clear. The Blessed Mother was with us, and that was the point. <clears throat> I had the privilege of growing up with very active priests and sisters in our neighborhood. It was not unusual to see these mostly young women and men roaming around our streets. They visited homes, they taught catechesis in parks, and they played sports. The sisters were very good at playing basketball, and the priests were the best at playing soccer. All children in the neighborhood wanted to be priests and sisters, of course, to play basketball and soccer like they did. <laughs> in our imaginaries, they did not have much to do with their time other than roaming through the streets, visiting homes, teach catechesis, go to church, and of course, play sports. That must have been why they were so good at them. But what we did not know was that our imagination was being prepared to understand the concepts and the ideas that we would later learn in our catechetical catech 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 classes. As a theologian, today I would say that the adults in my family and these pastoral leaders were providing an epistemic framework for us to understand the elements of truth and value of the Christian claims that have been handed on from generation to generation for nearly 2,000 years. That framework was somewhat taken for granted. It was supported by the cultural values, commitments, and presuppositions that identified a culture that saw itself as Catholic. As I was growing up, 93% of all people in Colombia self-identified as Catholic. Millions of Catholics in the United States grew up in some version of this particular sociocultural framework. That is the case of the, most of the 23 million immigrant Catholics living in this country. Most Catholics born and raised in the middle of the 20th century, and most Catholics growing up in traditional context, 
traditional both socially and religiously. But religious education in the, in the second half of the century, for most US Catholic adults, particularly those who are US born, took place in the midst of a different socio-cultural framework. That framework is one that seems more consistent with the pragmatistic and modernistic sensibilities, philosophically speaking, that characterize the larger US culture. Commenting on the various changes that transformed Catholics, uh, how Catholic, commenting on the various changes about how Catholics celebrated the liturgy at the time of the Second Vatican Council, Jesuit historian Mark Massa cites also historian Gary Willis saying, let out the dirty little, dirty little secret in the most startling symbolic way, the fact that the church changes. No more need a historical belief that one did on Sunday morning, what, what one did on Sunday morning looked with minor adjustments like what the church had always done from the time of the catacombs. All that lie in eternity and arranged air of timelessness as in May West's vestment and massive pose was shattered. The house with arrested clocks like Miss Havisham's Satis house collapsed by reverse dilapidation out of dead security into uncertain life. Massa, building on the work of Bernard Lohner again, points to a major paradigm shift marked by a new historical consciousness grounded in the conviction that humanity changes, reality changes, and how believers apprehend our relationship with the mystery of God within the realm of history also changes. U.S. Catholics needed urgently new approaches to catechesis that would meet the demands of being American and Catholic in the age of historical consciousness. If humanity, reality, and how we apprehend our relationship with the divine are in a process of constant change, it would not be long before Catholics would question taken for granted assumptions about their practice of their faith, and even the faith itself. I do not think that I need to provide too many examples about this. Tens of millions of women and men who grew up Catholic in the United States stopped self-identifying as such during the last half a century. It is estimated that about 20 million Catholics do not self-identify as such in this country. However, millions more <clears throat> accepted the challenge to educate their imaginations in this next context. To be honest, there was no choice. Catholic religious education theorists in the years following the Second Vatican Council experimented with various approaches to religious education. They borrowed from the fields of education, the human sciences, the social sciences, modern philosophy, and even the emerging so-called postmodern methods that we continue to discern in our day. There was something clear for many of these thinkers. If religious education was going to be effective, it needed to engage the experience of Catholics in the here and now of our existence. But not an ecstatic, an ecstatic experience. It was changing experience shaped by the political, cultural, and ideological roller coaster of our society. In many ways, we can call this major shift a cosmological anthropological shift. So we have gone from a classicist approach to religious education in which we got an institution that holds all the truths 
an institution that holds all the texts and that pretty much anticipates what's going to happen in the rest of our lives, to a model that we could call cosmological anthropological shift. Thomas Grooms, yes, our own Thomas Grooms, and his shared Christian praxis approach to religious education is perhaps the most representative pedagogy of this era. In fact, his is a model that has shaped most of the religious education world among Catholics and beyond during nearly half a century, both in the United States and throughout the world. Groom, inspired by the work of Paulo Freire, Jürgen Habermas, Bernard Lonergan, and several other great minds of the 20th century, reminded us that religious education was an exercise of critical appropriation of God's story, capital S, as it enters in dialogue with our own stories in the here and now of our own reality. As Groom famously coined, <clears throat> As Groom famously coined, <clears throat> religious education is about bringing life to faith, faith to life. Shared Christian praxis resonated with the pragmatistic and modernistic sensibilities of the US culture. It provided a way forward for religious education, particularly for Catholics, as the classicist approach was being left behind. Not without a good fight, of course. Even in our day, there are Catholics and other Christians looking backwards to some form of restoration of a largely idealized and romanticized past. Shared Christian praxis looked forward. Shared Christian praxis built upon some key modernistic presuppositions. The freedom of the human person to tell his or her own story, the capacity of self-definition, the possibility of critical dialogue or conversation among equals, the conviction that the Christian person, inspired by the gospel values, can transform reality and make a difference, etc. The model is a true affirmation of the human person as a child of God. If there is perhaps one friendly critique that I would make about shared Christian praxis and other North Atlantic models of Christian education, which I have shared actually with Tom Groom, is that they have not given due attention to the centrality of culture in the shaping of human experience and imagination. But more than a limitation, such focus seems like a natural step in the development of a pedagogical model that con continues to respond to many, many of the intellectual and educational demands of Christians of our time. <coughs> Catholics in the United States spent much of the 20th century figuring out how to embrace, contend with, and even fight modernity. We are still accompanying millions of immigrant Catholics and their families who are on their way, whose way of making meaning, faith, and experience of Catholicism were shaped in more classicist contexts as they integrate our culture. Growing up in Latin America, that first example that I gave earlier, that's a, a, that, that's, that shows the classicist approach. Catholicism taken for granted, mainly sustained by devotional life. But there has been much progress in that regard about integrating immigrants and their families. Yet, just when we thought that we were settling down on that front with our gains and our losses, it seems that we are at the dawn of another major paradigm shift that has come to us faster and more surprisingly than we would have ever imagined. Most religious education theories 
that support our work as catechetical leaders and Catholic educators were articulated when there were no computers, <laughs> or internet, or cell phones, and things such as virtual reality and social media platforms. Raise your hand if you ever lived at a time without a cell phone. Okay, so that's pretty much, no. Without the internet, without Facebook. Okay, you can see the, gen the generational differences here, no? <laughs> Catholic approaches to mass media at the time of the Second Vatican Council were concerned primarily with the danger of ideological use of media, how pastoral leaders could evangelize the world of communications, and how we can use media to communicate the gospel in an effective way. Science and technology did not play a central role in most conversations during the council, although references to these realities were hopeful, acknowledging their potential for good while denouncing their possible misuse. <clears throat> so what do computers, internet, cell phones, virtual reality, and social media platforms have in common? Although all of them are the product of human invention, they share four characteristics in common. <clears throat> One, they are repositories or delivery vehicles of vast amounts of information that are accessible to people practically without mediation or traditional institutions or vetting bodies. Everyone has access to that information. Everyone. Unlimited amounts of information. Two, they are programmed to operate using algorithms that evolve as they process the information that we provide, making associations that cater to our whims and likes, or to the whims and likes of those who control them, whether in controlled environments or through automatic settings. Three, they reach, they reach amazing numbers of people Across, board, across borders and differences, providing a sense of universality, commonality, and dependence never experienced before by humanity. In the blurring of borders and differences, a new universal narrative emerges, rewritten not necessarily with ideas or symbols or relationships, but with metadata that questions the power of the local story, the authority of the local traditions, and meanings of local rituals. Four, these dynamics defy taken for granted understandings of reality as we know it, and as we can control it, creating alternative worlds, not just worldviews, but alternative worlds that have the potential or shifting our attention from our lived reality. Altogether, these technological developments have led to the rise of artificial intelligence, which defines much of how we live and interact today. When we speak of artificial intelligence, we must not limit ourselves to imagine robots or sentient machines making their own decisions. Artificial intelligence, in its most basic definition, is the right performance of artifacts, usually with advanced levels of technology, assembled together to achieve a particular end. This brings us to the title of this lecture, Religious Education in the Age of Google, Facebook, Netflix, and SpaceX. If you were expecting a lecture that would look at each of these companies and how they operate 
and how many millions they make so we can learn something from them and bring those millions to our parishes as we educate people in the faith. Or maybe how these companies have tapped into, the area, into an area of our lives that is redefining the way in which we live our Christian identity, you will, live, you will be disappointed. There is definitely much that we can learn from these companies and how they operate, and from that area of our daily lives that they shape. And perhaps a better word for that would be that they control. I'm looking at a much bigger picture, and that's perhaps the key point of this presentation. If we were to give a name to the shift of this, that these practices are transforming, no, or to these practices, they are transforming not only our way of life and how we, we, we interact with one another. I would call this shift the artificial intelligence paradigm shift. One that is highly studied by scientists and scholars of culture, yet one that still remains largely unaddressed by religious educators. Google processes approximately 3.5 billion searches every day. Nearly 2 billion people in the entire world use this search platform. Facebook has about 2 billion monthly users. Nearly two-thirds of the US population uses Facebook. There are about 110 million Netflix users. Each of these users watches about one and a half hours every day, more than 500 hours a year. There are about 1.3 billion people using YouTube. 300 hours of video are uploaded to YouTube every minute, every minute. Almost five, million, five billion videos are watched in, on YouTube every single day. YouTube gets over 30 million visitors per day. SpaceX, the leading private company that is almost single-handedly developing technology that will help us to expand our space horizons in the 21st century. And we could go on and on and on and on. If we look at artificial intelligence only as a series of products that can make our lives easier or ent entertain us, then we are missing the point and we have not understood our historical moment. We are talking about a new epistemological shift. It is a shift that is transforming our way of life and eventually our understanding of how faith and life are in relationship. Are we prepared for this? This leads me back to William and Victoria. William and Victoria are growing up in the United States and most likely they will not have to go from a classicist to a modernistic and eventually to an artificial intelligent paradigm. They will grow up in this third paradigm. Most millennials in the United States and their children are growing up in the midst of this third paradigm, the artificial intelligence paradigm. Their lives are constantly shaped by Facebook, by Netflix, and by all these new technologies that build on the mining of metadata. How they understand the reality has gone from what computer experts call Web 1.0 technology, in which we were given the data, which is pretty much what we used to do in carry cases, we were receptors of, of data and information, to web 2.0 technology in which we're given some data 
and then we respond, which is the case of email. But most of them and their lives are being transformed but by what's being called Web 3.0 meta uh, technology, meaning these young women and men are interacting with machines and computer software that makes decisions for them. What they read, what they value, what they, uh, <clears throat> what they use to make decisions in the everyday <clears throat> is being mined, is being produced by computer software. What kind of, in, what kind of religious education then is needed as we, move, uh, as we move forward. We know that millions of people are growing up in this paradigm, millions of Catholics. But it is likely that religious education pedagogies and frameworks have not caught up with what is coming or what is already the reality for many of them. Technically, we are doing religious education today in the midst of intergenerational homes faith communities that are intergenerational and intercultural and that require leaders that understand these realities. Where do we move from here? Three recommendations. One, we need more research on this current paradigm shift in religious education. We need religious educators writing dissertations on these particular realities. We need students of theology and religious education and catechesis engaging the questions that are emerging about morality, the way we articulate meaning in our, in our realities, the epistemic realities that are shifting, and then how they shape the way we make meaning in our lives and understand religion. Two, we need fresher pedagogies of religious education that engage technology not in a utilitarian way, but engage technology as artificial intelligence. That is something that we still have not, ha have not begin to, began, began, began to embrace, but in religious education we cannot stay behind if we wanna keep up with the next generation. And thirdly, we need bridge people. We have, in these intergenerational homes and faith communities, we need people who are able to bring together those of us who were raised in the faith, in the classicist model, who may have transitioned to a more uh, uh, anthropological, cosmological shift, historical consciousness, and those who are transitioning or live in the artificial intelligence model. We need those bridge people, those bridge educators, bridge uh, catechists. My dear friends, we have entered into a new frontier that calls for creativity and fresher approaches to religious education. Are we ready? Thank you. So any thoughts, questions? You know, I do, do not have all the answers, but we can Google them, you know, so. <laughs> isn't it? That's, that's what we do, isn't it? <laughs> we can Google. So any thoughts, reactions, comments? You know, I mean, this is a, this is a time for a conversation. What did you hear in your groups and in your, in your different uh, interactions? What are your reactions to this idea? Hello, thank you. Um, I was talking with my new friend here, and something that really struck me in what you said is the idea that we have this all this access to information, yet we still it's still a controlled environment, and that it is the computers that are making decisions for us. I think about when I type into Google and I start typing in education, it immediately comes up religious education, Ronner. I'm like, oh. <laughs> um, and so I think what keeps coming up in my work with students is 
you know, how to give them a platform where they can be creative, but that they can also be agents as well. Mm -hmm. And that we can turn the decision making away from the computer making all the decisions to the person now becoming an agent in their faith. How to ask questions that go beyond these controlled environments that make the decisions for us and how we can become creative with that approach. Absolutely. And, and I believe that one of the challenges, so let me just put this a little bit down. What, one of the challenges that we have is that we continue to operate in, a, in the way we educate in our Catholic schools, Christian schools, and our churches. We continue to use the model of Christian education in which you, know, you got the expert, the catechist who is an expert or who uses a textbook, and then you know, the students play a passive role. When we speak about agency, you know, I mean, literally what some of this, this, uh, this software and these companies are doing is they outsource the agency. You know? So if you're looking for God and love, you know, just Google those two words, or you go to your Facebook feed, you know, and then they do it for you. you know? And if you are a more traditional Catholic, what a coincidence that you get a lot of uh, information you know, about more traditional Catholicism. If you are a more progressive Catholic, then eventually you find information in the people you want to read you know, and the theologians that, that, that you read. So the, the key for us in religious education is to, on the one hand, learn about this. I have spoken with countless religious educators on so, sometimes on these topics, and I ask them, you know, I asked them, how many of you, I'm going to switch to this one. That's what I was so how, how, many, how many of you uh, are aware of Google, you know, and, uh, and how Google operates and how Facebook operates? How many of you are aware of the algorithms and metadata, for instance? You no, know? metadata is this reality today that controls our lives, our shopping you know, needs, and what we like, what we do not like, you know, and everything is tailored by, by this kind of metadata. How can we use it in order to educate people in the faith, but not only that, to form their values and to, ma and to make meaning? I think that the worst thing that could happen to all of us eventually is that through these processes of artificial intelligence, we are rendered, you know, and I don't want to be negative about artificial intelligence. I think that that's the way to go. We're moving in that direction, you know. There's very little that we can do right now. Virtual reality, that is happening. But I don't think that, uh, I mean, we cannot be naive. And how do we develop the criteria? We should be giving people the criteria, religious educators, but also young Catholics and, and the people who are using these, uh, these uh, uh, platforms. Other thoughts back there? Yes, sir. Thank you for your talk this evening. I wondered um, about the implications for religious education specific to uh, two things. One is that, you know, the Thomistic view of the world that we, we learn through our senses and through engaging with things um, in a sacramental worldview where, where more and more people are experiencing a life that is, as you said, in an alternate reality. Mm -hmm. that. Um, in a sense, matter doesn't matter anymore, that we use the things that God has created in the world and use those things to, to learn about ourselves and God and God's hopes and dreams for us. And then the second part is, if, if we're living in this curated reality about what we like, what, what are the implications for encountering the other? Um, those who are different than we are and those who might not like what we like. Um, those who are confronting us in our presumptions and presuppositions and, and things of that nature. I'm, I'm just wondering about that in terms of religious education, how we grapple with the immaterial, how we grapple with a curated other um, in this world. I, I do not have an answer per se, but I have a reaction to your, to your, uh, to your thoughts on this one. And uh, I think that one question that emerges for us as, uh, as Catholics and as Christian educators is, is it possible to encounter the sacred in the virtual world? You know, is it possible? And, you know, and it's got, in, in our sense is yes, you know, but uh, 
how do we interact with the sacred in the virtual world in a sense that it doesn't isolate us from that larger reality that, 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 you, uh, that, you, that you are describing? And uh, on, on the other hand, you know, uh, we need to also keep in mind that we as a society in the United States are more segregated than ever in our history. We are more segregated, you know, ideologically, racially, ethnically, even economically than during the time of the Jim Crow laws and any other time prior to this. So in many ways, you know, little by little, and that's what I, this is the kind of point that I wanted to say, you know, the, the, not these companies, but these technologies, these technologies are isolating us and invite, I can literally Google, you know, a neighborhood you know, with people who think like me, maybe look like me, unfortunately, no, and then, and then who look like me, who think like me, who like to go to the same activity, do the same activities as me, and moved into that neighborhood. We can do that. When you're buying a home, what's exactly, that's exactly the, the, what we do. We go to one of these big in, you know, internet companies, we search for that, and then we move into the, into the neighborhood. So these technologies, this artificial intelligence world in which we're entering is shaping us. That's how we choose, we choose churches as well, you know? In the United States of America, according to the Center for Applied Research in the Apostolate, about half of all Catholics in this country do not go to our home parishes. We go to the parishes that we choose. And how do we choose them? Usually we Google them, no? We encounter our communities through Facebook. We encounter our communities through all this media, and that's how we are making, making these decisions. And then what about communities that are poor? What about communities that do not fit our own standards, our likes and whims, as I was saying in the lecture? Thank you, Paul. There was a, uh, Stefano? Thanks. <clears throat> One thing that I've, that I've been mulling over um, is, is the importance of building a critical inquiry into the agency of, of people encountering not just religious information, but any sort of information mm -hmm. online. Um, one thing that these metadata and algorithms allow people to do is to spread misinformation like a, like a wildfire. Yes, um, and that information is can be responsible for all sorts of phobias uh, based on differences, and so I'm wondering, you know, how can we, how can we teach people to be critical critical inquirers online, through, and as well as offline for religious education? I mean, I think that has to be an important step. Uh, that's and, and that's the point, you know. Certainly, you know. We, Religious education, as we move into the future, and not, not, you know, faith formation for all of us as Christians and other religious groups in our society, faith formation is going to be mostly about, we're going to be playing the role of referees in many ways. You know? Referees providing the rules and the criteria for people. But the first challenge for all of us is, are we ready to provide that criteria? Do we know what the criteria is? Do we know what, where people could go? What could they be using? What shouldn't they be using? You know? And that's the challenge. This is a fast moving world. But if we do not do it, algorithms are gonna do it. And they're already doing it. You know? and, and again, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to refrain, restrain myself from taking a, a negative look on this. You know? But I think that there's a lot of possibility. We need more research about it. I have not read the first you know, book that actually is taking you know, this in consideration. We, we, read, we have books on religious education, dissertations on religious education, and the media. But we're not looking at the whole question of artificial intelligence. And, and another point that I, that I made earlier, you know, artificial intelligence is not something that is going to happen in the year 200 and, you know, 2200. It is already happening. And it's been happening for a long, long while. You know, artificial intelligence is not, as I said, you know, these sentient machines. If you watch the movie The Matrix, for instance, you know, that's 
we think that until we get to that point, then we're safe, you know, then we're, we're good. Artificial intelligence is this, your, our phones. That's artificial intelligence, you know. A switch, you know, in a, that, that turns lights on and off. Our cars, all this is artificial intelligence. And as long as these things start mo little by little moving our lives, controlling our lives, then sometimes we don't even notice what's going on. Sir. I wonder about the role of emotions in this new world and there, is there a role of, for emotion? It seems to be left out of a lot of this virtual reality. A lot of people, are, you know, just don't deal with their emotions anymore. But I, if they do it short term, and I think that is so crucial to, to the faith, you know, we talk about love and all those aspects. Sure. So I want to comment on that. I would comment on that briefly, but I would invite someone, for instance, you know, one of those, those of you who are millennials, you know, who are living day and night in this world, my sense is that uh, definitely, I mean, as long as the human person is involved in these dynamics, you know, e emotions are, are, are there, you know, so the, the, the emotions. But the, the question, I guess, that the next step to your question is, how is this technology manipulating our emotions, you know? I think, how is this technology manipulating what we believe is of God and what is not of God? Our commitments here, our commitments there. And, and, and that's perhaps the, the question that's more important for us as we shape, shape minds and hearts through religious education. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. I, I like what you say that uh, technology is not, uh, we are not condemning technology, mm -hmm. but it's a life that we have to embrace. We as religious educators, we are educating children who come from families. I like what you say that we learn faith from family. And then, what is the, an approach that will help parents who are also in this kind of uh, situation whereby they are not in a good relationship with their children because of this world mm -hmm. media? What is the approach that educators and parents and the children, uh, those children come from those kind of families to embrace this kind of life of faith. Thank you. Uh, that's certainly, you know, th those are the, the, you're pointing out to the risks and uh, when technology becomes a divider rather than a unifier aspect in the life of the family or in the life of, uh, of the community. And that's why one of my, my third recommendation in the, in the lecture was we need bridge people. You know, we all need to become bridges in many ways. We need bridge people who, you know, most likely for my two children, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be able to tell them, don't Google things, don't use Facebook, or don't use any other technologies that are gonna come into their lives, you know? So, but I cannot become my children either. And so, in a sense, I, I need, we need to start developing this, you know, these bridging skills, bridging skills in which we can, we're, we're able to understand the pros and the cons of these technologies in order to build community, in order to build, to build, to build family, to build community, to build society. And we need, the church should provide the spaces. You know, Catholics should not feel alone having these conversations. Parents should not feel alone having these conversations. We should be having this, this dialogue at the local, diocesan, national levels. And that's perhaps, you know, the, this is how perhaps religious education will be changing as we move forward into the next uh, uh, decades. Alfred? Thank Hoffman for your presentation. I am very much struck by your comment on how social media and technology in general does shape the way we know and consciousness. And I think it's really bringing forth a new language. Mm -hmm. I think in the simplest way, we are getting words that we never had before. Even Google is a new word. 
uh, nouns that we used to use have become verbs. Yes. And I think that language is key in shifting the consciousness of people. Yes. And part of the difficulty in being a religious educator, for me, is recognizing the generational gap is I have to keep learning this language and what language is going out there mm -hmm. and what symbols are going out there. Yes. How do I even learn these symbols? And as I think about it, might one way be let the young people and children teach us. Yes. Because then that becomes an opportunity for conversation rather than a tool that say, take this and keep quiet. Mm -hmm. You know, because there is that challenge in bridging in learning that language and learning those symbols that are foreign to me. You know, and with the rate in which technology is changing, you just come to a point where I'm just trying to chase one thing after another, I'm not knowing how to catch up. Yeah. Just one thing I just want to uh, lift up. Second point I think as I think about is the challenges and the opportunities that technology provide for virtue formation. Yes. I think this thing about religious education and virtue formation, we need to see that new connection again. Just given the kind of nasty things that people say on social media. And I wonder like, do they really behave like that in real life? <laughs> Probably not. But the way they perceive what social media space is like mm -hmm. and virtue formation that needs to take place in relationship, but yet technology that also challenges those very relationships and breaks it down because it feeds into a culture of isolation and culture of individualism. Yes. So I think the challenges and the opportunities for virtual formation the, 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 the real channel of picking up the language and these are things I just want to throw out there. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, and I just want to comment on, on your first point. You're absolutely right. We, we are at the dawn of an emerging grammar with new symbols, with new rules that we need to learn as religious educators, as parents, as pastoral leaders. Otherwise, there's going to come a point in which we are not going to be able to communicate with the, 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 new, the, new, the new generations. I think that the epistemic change is already here. I believe that we are already in, in, in a new framework, in a, a new epistemic framework. And it was, uh, I think it's, the framework is as radical as it was when we shifted from a classicist approach to <clears throat> one that is more modernistic. Uh, I believe that we're at the dawn of something, so, something different. And that is, and the, and the language is be in, in the grammar. You know, those symbols that we, that we use to communicate are being written right now. Are we going to be left behind as Christians, as Catholics, as religious educators? No, that's where we need to really we need we need people engaged in this dialogue. Well, I think, Jen. Um, thank you. Here's the question: Is um, when you're talking about the parish and the church being the place where adults can gather to work this through, mm -hmm. um, that's not any parishes that I know now. Right. Um, and I'm not, and I'm, I'm just seeing that the moves we're making with this education aren't leading in this direction. Mm -hmm. I just wonder, what do we need to yeah. do next? Uh, you know what, Jane? I think that... Um, and I agree with you, not many parishes move in that direction because of the leadership, pretty much, you know. If leaders do not want, are not ready, prepared to do this, they're not going to lead their communities in there. But the ultimate outcome is, will be rendered obsolete and irrelevant. Will be rendered, you know, I mean, the fact that the vast majority of people in the United States who are former Catholics left the Catholic Church before the age of 24, and when one asked them, you know, when there are surveys about him, why did you leave? They said, I didn't see any connection. I didn't see any connection between my life and what's going on in church. Last year, the Center for Applied Research in the Apostolate did a study on young children, young Catholic children, and why are they choosing to leave the faith at the age of 13? Young Catholic children in this country leaving Catholicism at the age of 13, number one uh, reason, incompatibility between what they are hearing at home and in church and classroom on matters of science. So 
they, 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 don't see, they don't see that. So the question is, how much science are we talking about in our religious education classes? How much technology are we engaging in our religious education classes? What will be the parish of the future? I think that that's, per, that's perhaps the, 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 the question that you know, should be a, even down the road, a book or, or, or a dissertation, you know? What would be the parish that is actually gonna take this artificial intelli intelligence paradigm you know, and build a new community? Thank you. That's just, yes. Thank you very much, it was very interesting. Uh, the new language is definitely required. Um, may I just say that, um, you know, if we look at the dawning of technology, it doesn't have to be in the last 50 years. Um, one could argue that the internet, you know, started when 1956 when Sputnik was launched and the U.S. started a Cold War competition with uh, the Soviets at that time. Uh, it was really a way to sort of have an ability to retaliate after a nuclear first attack. That was the dawning of the internet. But these technological challenges that impact on society, what is love, how to tr treat your neighbor, you could go back to the age of industrialization when there was a significant technical shift into how you know, things were produced, et cetera. Have the theologians and church leaders imbibe some lessons from that first technological shift that we can somehow learn from because uh, when I do volunteer on Sundays after Mass um, here in Cambridge uh, nearby, the, there's a level of politeness mm -hmm. where people are not really going to engage in really um, very thought-provoking discussions. You know, you teach catechism to the children in creative ways uh, about uh, the golden rule, but mm -hmm. you don't delve much more deeply than that. Like it, I agree, I think folks may not be well prepared, but there is also this cultural dynamic. It might be a New England thing, yes. where you don't really uh, cross these sort of polite uh, notes of discussion. You know, you're not gonna get into social justice and <laughs> mm -hmm. Catholic social teaching around it uh, mm -hmm. because it's a bit too controversial, even in enlightened and liberal Massachusetts. So I pose nope. a challenge out there that Absolutely. we've had Thank a long you. time to mull it over, and we still. Thank you. Work Thank work you. And we, got, we 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 got to you know if, if being polite means not to address these realities, well, it's time to be in, impolite. You know, just we we, we got to shift. You know, the church has been a prophetic community. Christians have been a prophetic community from day one. You know, we we can we cannot give up on that prophet prophetism, and the the other piece is that. There are theologians who are actually engaging the question of science, but there are a handful, just a handful, you know? We, I think that as we move into the future, we're gonna, have, we're gonna need more theologians and religious educators engaging these particular questions head on. That's, that's the future, it's the present already. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Jane, so. <clears throat>